Okay, great. So then we can get started. So today's topic is tidy data and wrangling for statistical analysis in R. And this is a foundational skill that's necessary and sometimes a little bit undervalued in doing statistical analysis. And what we mean by that is just getting the data in the format that it needs to be to be able to run standard statistical tests and, and also to do some graphing. So the first thing we are going to do is enter the tidyverse. So the tidyverse collection of packages includes the package dplyr, which is what we're primarily using. It's this kind of orange sticker here. Um, so go ahead and load the package if you already have it using a library call. And if you get an error and or you have never used tidyverse before, then use the command install.packages, tidyverse in quotes, to install the package. And then you still have to run the library command every time you want to use tidyverse in a script. So if you don't have it already, you'll need to run this first. And they have just updated to tidyverse 2.0.0, which sounds very fancy. You don't need that version to do what we're doing today. There's nothing about it that won't work in any old version. Um, you might want to update, but it's probably easier to do so after the tutorial since you might have to restart R and it can be a little bit, can take a little bit of time. But yes, so all you need is the tidyverse package today. And we are going to be using some data about art history. So you can read it in here, this command, and we've named it artists. And this comes from the um, R for Data Science Tidy Tuesday project, where they post new data sets every week on Tuesday. And this one was posted in January, I believe. And it contains different information about artists, so like visual artists, and how they are represented in art history textbooks, so in two famous art history textbooks. And I'll actually open the data set so we can take a look. So it includes the artist's name, the edition of the textbook, and what year it was published in. And it tells you what the artist's nationality was. And this is like a simplified nationality. It tells you their gender, uh, race, their ethnicity. This is the name of the textbook. And then what they do is they, um, so this is for someone's PhD thesis, I believe. And they looked at how many pages were dedicated to each artist in this textbook in this year. So one would mean like one full entire page. So this is like about a third of a page was dedicated to this artist, uh, this artist in this edition of the textbook. And each artist has a unique ID. And there's a little bit of information about whether or how many exhibitions that artist had at the MoMA, so the Museum of Modern Art, or the Whitney, which is another museum. And then this is a simplified race column. So it allows us to look at the representation of different artists along these social categories across the years and across these art history textbooks. Okay, so that's the, that's the data that we're going to be using today. And one of the main topics we're going to be talking about is tidy data. So what is tidy data and why is it important? These are great illustrations by Alison Horst that talk about the concept of tidy data. So Hadley Wickham says that tidy data is a standard way of mapping the meaning of a data set to its structure. It's basically a standard data set format that your data should pretty much always be in if your plan is to either plot or analyze this data with a, with a statistical method. And what makes data tidy data is that each variable is a column. So here there's a little example of a tidy data set, which has the names and colors of cats. And so you have each column is a variable like ID is a variable, the name is a variable, and the color of the cat. Uh, each observation forms a row. So here each row uh, pertains to one cat. So a cat named Merlin, who's black, for example, um, a cat named Cat, who's orange. And that means each cell is a single measurement. So here you have the color of the cat and no other information. There's not, it's not the color and the weight 
or um, yeah, there's no sort of like double variables. So this is all it needs. This is all data needs to be considered tidy. And though these are really simple, it can sometimes be a little bit deceiving to figure out when data is really tidy. So we'll work on that a little bit. Okay, so each variable is a column, each observation is a row, and each cell is a single measurement. Why is this important? Um, it's important because that means that all the tidy data sets are alike, and then R knows what to expect, and you can run different tests and do different um, visualizations without having to think about the structure of your data because your data you already know is in the correct structure. On the flip side, every messy data set is messy in its own way. And that is a trouble for statistical modeling, um, but I'm gonna show you some tools that you can use to wrangle these unruly data sets into tiny data sets. And it's just another visualization about how you can use the same tools to work on tidy data, but when you have this untidy data, you have to always come up with new solutions and always try to make workarounds to make your data fit with what's expected for further steps. Okay, so how do we get tidy data? That's where data wrangling comes in. You'll hear Yulia and I talk about data wrangling very often, and all it means is getting the data into this correct format. And again, this is often where the dplyr data set come, uh, dplyr package comes into play. And one of the most noticeable features of this and of the tidyverse in general is this collection of symbols, which is called the pipe. So it's technically a percent sign, a greater than sign, and a percent sign. Um, but it's easily also typed with the keyboard shortcut control or command, depending if you're on Windows or Mac. Shift and M. That will uh, give you the entire pipe at once. And every time you see the symbol, you know that what it's doing is taking the item before it and just giving it to whatever comes next, usually on the next line, as the first argument. This is really, uh, you can use it in a lot of ways in the tidyverse because all tidyverse functions take the data frame as the first function. So you can take a data frame, do something to it, and then take that modified data frame and do something else to it. And this allows you to string together wrangling commands. This is where you can get really creative with wrangling. So just as a brief example here, uh, you can look at the column names of a data set by taking call name, calling call names on the data set. There's nothing else you have to do. Prints out the names of the columns. If you wanted to write this with the pipe, you could take the data set and pipe it to column names because you know it's going to give it to call names as the first argument. So you would get the same output. Okay, just to clarify that, since we will be using the pipe quite a bit in the upcoming command. But the first thing we can talk about in terms of data wrangling is maybe getting nice data, um, so column labels. This is especially useful when you're doing a lot of data wrangling if you have weird or very long names that will make it like slow to type out later. So, for example, what was bothering me when I was working on this data set is that this um, variable that has to do with how many pages the artist shows up on is called space underscore ratio underscore per underscore page underscore total. This is descriptive, but it's very long. And I wanted to change this to space ratio. So you just have the data set and you pipe it to rename and then new name equals old name. So the new name is space ratio and the old name was space ratio per page total. And you can see this prints out a, um, a preview for me. But if I open up this data set again, it hasn't actually changed it in my data set. So whatever's in my environment is not changed. It's just doing it in this little kind of preview. And so to overcome that, you have to rewrite the data frame to make sure you save your changes. So now we can do the same command artists and pipe it to rename. New name equals old name to the column. And then we just save it over top of artists. And when I run this, you'll see I actually don't get any printout. But now when I go to the data frame, it's changed. 
So that's kind of a core point of wrangling in Tidyverse is that if you want to save the changes, you have to make sure you overwrite the data frame or you can write it to a new data frame. OK, so that's rename. Um, another quick and easy wrangling step is select, which just pulls out a single column. For example, I could take this artist data set and I could select the artist name column. And you'll see that in these tidyverse commands, when you call a column by its name, it doesn't need quotes, it doesn't need any sort of punctuation. You just use the exact name, um, assuming that there's not spaces in the name. Then you would have to put back ticks. But. So here we can select the artist name column, and you'll see it pulls out just the artist name, but all of the rows that are included in this column. On its own, not super useful, maybe, but you can use it to look look more closely at the preview in different columns. And you can also use this to pull up multiple columns just by adding additional columns with a comma. So you could take the artist name and its and the artist gender, and then you'll get all the rows, including all the duplications, and you'll see the value in the artist name column as well as the artist gender column. And you can list as many as you want there. And you can also use additional functions. So if you have uh, long data sets, you can look into sort of select helper functions. A couple that are easy to use would be something like starts with and ends with. So for example, artists select starts with the word artist. And um, you'll so remember that select always picks out columns. So we're looking for any columns that start with artist. And because we're matching a string, so we're matching letter to letter, we put this kind of search term in quotes. So if we run this, you'll see we pull out the columns that start with the word artist, which here is artist name, artist nationality, artist gender, artist race, race artist ethnicity, and so on. And ends with would mean that it was the same thing, but at the end of the column name. Um, another wrangling command is arrange. And this will allow, allow you to order the data set based on the values in a given column. So I want to show this by looking only at three columns, just so that we don't get confused with um, what we're looking at. So you could, for example, first pipe to select and pull out the artist name, artist gender, and year columns. And you'll see if I highlight partial code, it's only going to run that part of the code. So right now I'm, I'm just looking at what's being done by the select call. And you can see it's pulling out all the values for these three columns, exactly as we would expect. But it's still in alphabetical order because it's in the order that the data set was in. So what I can do is add another pipe here at the end of this step and pipe it on to a range, which will order it based on a, on a certain column. And in this case, I want to arrange it based on year. So now you can see that it's ascending, it's, it's sorted ascending by year. So 1926 comes first and um, it goes up from there. So that's a range. And by default, uh, that's in an ascending order, so from small to larger. But you can also wrap the column name in this DESC for descending. And that will start from the large values and go um, to smaller. So for example, here I've now added the column space ratio to see how many pages the artist shows up on. And if I pipe that on to um, arrange by descending space ratio, then we can first see who got the most pages in, in our history textbook. So it seems that um, Pablo Picasso got the most um, pages in many of the textbooks. And you can see that it's been sorted by that variable. And again, if you have any questions, including on related topics or going a step further, um, please put them in the chat. and. Julia will read it out to me. So feel free to put questions there.
Okay, so next is the mutate command. And this is where we get into really wrangling, I would say. Um, because mutate allows you to create a new column. Let's see if I can see this. Based on values in an old column um, or combining values. You can see here like A plus B equals C in these columns. Ella, before you move on to that, quick question in the mm -hmm. chat. Um, could we have the arrange before select? Um, yeah, you could do that. That would, so if you just arranged, first of all, if you just arrange without select, this takes all the columns in the data set, but they're still arranged by uh, space ratio, this one. So you can see that, for example, Pablo Picasso is still right at the top. And then you don't have to select, but if you still wanted to, you could also select afterwards and that would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not always the case that you can change the order, but in this case, you can change the order. Thanks. Thank yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, so mutate. Again, so it allows you to create a new column and you can also use the values of the old column to create a new column. And by default, this goes row by row. So for example, and this doesn't make much conceptual sense, but I think it's easy to see. If we decided we wanted to add plus three to every space ratio, for some reason, there's three more pages about each, each and every artist that we didn't capture. And we wanna go through every single row and add plus three to the space ratio. Then we could run um, a mutate command that looks like this. So you take the, the data frame, pipe to mutate, new column name equals, and then this is where you set what you want the new column to be equal to. So here's space ratio plus three. And this will overwrite the space ratio column um, by adding whatever was in there before plus three. And you see it goes row by row. So it's taking whatever value was there before, whether it was 0 0.5 or 0 0.4 or 0 0.3 and adding three to it. And you could even make this a new column. So say you wanted to call this space ratio plus three, then you could have your regular space ratio column unaffected and then have an additional column where it's plus three. So that depends on whether you use the exact same name or whether you put a new name there. Now you can do this for numbers like you saw there with the plus three, but you can also use it for strings and for a variety of different commands. But let's take, for example, this str to upper. This is, um, I believe from the Springer package and it takes strings, which just means text and puts it all in uppercase. So we could, for example, take the artist name column and rewrite it by the uppercase artist name, row by row. So again, it's data frame, mutate, new column equals whatever you wanna to do to the old column or in general. So here, for example, um, everything's now uppercase. And I wanna point out two things here. First of all, what, one other thing that is easy to do is to round a number. For example, we had this, um, I don't like the space ratio. I think it's a little bit too exact for me. It's hard for me to wrap my head around um, a decimal that big. So what you can do is use the round command, which takes whatever value you wanna round and then how many decimals you want it to have. So here I want to round whatever values in the space ratio column to two decimal points. And I want to overwrite the space ratio column with that. So I pipe this artist, uh, mutate, and then do this whole procedure. And you know that if I overwrite the previous data frame like this, that means that I'm kind of committing my, my changes so first I would probably look at it. That's probably a good idea. Look at it and check that it's done what I wanted it to do, which it has. And then when I'm happy, I can overwrite my data set so that now whenever I go forward, the space ratio column is gonna be rounded to two. 
And sometimes people ask about these additional parentheses. And you can see when I overwrote this data set, it doesn't give me any printout. And if I want to overwrite it and get printout, I add these additional um, parentheses around the entire code for this block. So if you see these extra parentheses, I'm doing that because for teaching and making reports, sometimes it's easier to have a preview. Okay, are there any questions? Um, no, if you're seeing chat activity, that's just us chatting about where, how to find old scripts on your computer. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Great. Okay, so a special thing that you can do with mutate that makes it a lot more flexible is use case when. And here's another um, fantastic Alice in Horse graph that shows you how to use this. It might look a little bit complicated, but we'll go through it. It's case when. And what you can do is use a mutate command to make a new column. Here they've made this danger column where you can look at what value is in a different column and decide what the value should, value should be in this column based on that. So here they're saying, if the type is Kraken, which is these two rows, <clears throat> then the danger level should be extreme, which you see this column has. But if it's anything else, like a dragon, a cyclops, anything else, then the danger should be high. So let's look at an example with this. Uh, art history data set. So we have this artist and we pipe it, and then we open this mutate command, which you see it spans this whole section of code. And we give a column name. Here I'm making a new column called more than one page. And all I wanna do is use the space ratio column to decide if this artist showed up on more than one page or not. So, and one total page, right? I can't know if it was two <laughs> small bits on different pages, but I've made this more than one column page equals case when. And open these parentheses and I've determined my conditions. So if the space ratio column is greater than one, then I want this, the entry in the more than one page column to read yes. If the space ratio column is less than or equal to one for this row, then I want it to read no. And I want the default to be no. So you can write this as dot default, or you can write it um, like they do here with true squiggle high. So you could say true squiggle <laughs> no, but I use this dot default because it's easier for me to remember. Okay, so let's see what this does. And to make it easier, I'm going to pipe this to select and look just at, let's say, the artist name, um, the space ratio, and more than one page. And remember that I renamed this column. So if you are following along, make sure you save that renaming the column, run all the code above to make this work. But now you can see, I'm going to keep the code on the page too, that you can see the artist's name. And if the space ratio is less than or equal to one, you get no, and if it's greater than yes. So most people are no, but there are a couple yeses. There we go. For example, Monet. So this is really flexible and allows you to do a lot of things. Um, Let's look at another example. For example, this these columns about the art exhibitions. So it tells you up until that year, how many exhibitions did they have at the MoMA and at Whitney. So a lot of artists don't have any, but then there's some, for example, this one had two in this year. Maybe it'd be easier to see um, the artist's name and the year. So this writer had one up until 1936. And then if there are additional, then that counter kind of like goes up. So Stieglitz had two at the moment in 1959. And by 1991, he had had three total. By 1996, four. Okay, so that's just to show you which columns we're working with. But I wanted to know, okay, what if we made a column called exhibition? And in that column, I just want to know if they've had at least one exhibition in either the MoMA or the Whitney. And so for this, I can 
again, start with the data frame, pipe it to a mutate command, and then list new column equals what do you want to do? So the new column is called exhibition. And I'm setting it equal to this big case when. And for this, I'm looking for this row, is the MoMA count greater than zero? If so, I want exhibition to say yes. If not, carry on to the next line. So then is the Whitney count greater than zero? If so, I want the exhibition column to say yes. If not, continue on to the next line. And then by the time you get down here, you just get the default, which is no. Let's run that and I would, and I'll, we'll look exactly at these columns again. Try to leave it on the screen. So you can see Aaron Douglas here. <laughs> have to include this column so we can actually look at it. Exhibition. So yeah, zero in the MoMA, zero in the Whitney. So no exhibition at all up to that year. Right. And again, like you saw, there was a lot of zeros in this data frame, but then as soon as someone has a number in the MoMA count, they get a yes for the exhibition. And if they have Whitney, this is still a yes, doesn't matter how many. And see if there's any, yeah, this one, for example, had a ton at the Whitney, but none, none in the MoMA, and this also counts as a yes. And so what this example really shows is that you can use counts from different columns as well. So you can go through the row and check, is the value in this column equal to or greater than a certain number? And then if not, check this next column. And they do, it does go in order, so it has to get a no to this to go into this one. Uh, are there any questions about that? Um, no, I don't see any questions right now. If you have questions, feel free to post them about that because that's a little bit, can be a little bit complicated. Uh, and you can use any sort of logical operators here. So you could also use um, a double equals whenever we're testing the equivalence in tidyverse, we use a double equals. So you could say, is this exactly zero? Is it equal to zero using a double equals? Okay, so that is case when. And again, you always have to remember that case when comes within a mutate command. I think that's kind of tricky to remember. But let's look at something that does not. So that would be the filter command, which looks like I did not include this image in our image folder. But let's look at it just on the data set. Um, and filter will just select rows that fit a certain logic or condition. So you use the same logical operators that you saw in case when. For example, we could look at all the rows where the year is greater than 2000. And that's just going to go through every row, check if the year is greater than 2000. And if so, it's going to show it to me. Kata, if you want to show the picture, it's a JPEG. I think that's a problem, not PNG. <laughs> Thank you for that yep. um, hot tip. <laughs> Okay, so this is the, the, the image for filter. Um, and it shows the data type, and then you can set these conditions, like if the type command, uh, the type column is exactly equal to otter, and the site is equal to bay, then you want to return that row, and if not, don't return that row. So this command would output these purple lines, only the ones where otter and bay so otter is the type and site is bay, and the other ones like otter and the wharf are not going to show. So that's the example with using year. You can also use um, the double equals to get the exact year, like I just mentioned with the case when. So here I've decided I want to make a new data set called Artist 2020. Maybe I'm doing a project where I just want to look at which artists were represented in the 2020 versions of the textbook and how many pages did they get. So I can save this to a new data set that will then show up here. I'm not actually sure which one it is, um, which has been filtered to only include the rows where the year is 2020. And again, you always use a double equals when testing equivalence in um, Tidyverse. So when you're checking if something is equal to. 
if you just do one equals, um, this is going to complain. But luckily, quite a uh, quite an informative error message there. So you can also use this equal equals to look at strings, in which case you need to put the, the string that you're trying to match in quotations. And it has to be spelled exactly, <laughs> so it's not Google. Um, so here we can look for Georgia O'Keeffe. And we use double equals, and we put the name in quotes. And then it pulls out all the rows where Georgia O'Keeffe is mentioned. Here we can also, I, when I was looking at this data set, I was wondering how they, how they, um, how they sort of categorize gender. And I noticed they had male, female, and NA. So I wanted to look at where the NAs were. <laughs> and then I later went back and when we read in the data, actually I removed the NAs. So we're not gonna be able to look at the NAs because I actually took them out. <laughs> but you could, I was trying to show here how you could look at what is equal to something and what is not equal to something. So if we look at the does not equal NA column, then it pulls up all the things that are not NAs, NAs which happens to be everything since I dropped them. Um, but one thing I forgot to show here that I want to show is just how to do multiple conditions. So for example, if we want to look at the artist data frame and we want to filter that artist gender um, is female, then just like in this picture, we can have in the and sign, and this connects two conditions that both have to be true in order for this row to get returned. So I wanted to look at um, artists who are classified as female who have at least one page of, okay, at least half a page of representation in the textbook. <laughs> That's pretty sad. But okay, let's look at half a page. And then it pulls out exactly this. So there's 58 rows here where the artist is a female and the space is more than 0.5. And you can also use the uh, straight pipe to do or. Um, find that key on my keyboard there. This one will pull up if the gender is female or the space ratio is greater than or equal to um, 0.5. Mm -hmm. There's a question uh, in the chat. Um, how like how could you filter the data frame so that you get um, the artist's name consisting of George? So if you want to find someone who's called George in this data set. Yeah, so you could do um, you know, is this going to work if I do in? I think so what you can do is I think you can filter if you type in the complete name that should work. Yeah. But if mm -hmm. you if you want anyone named George and you don't care what their the other parts of their name are, you can try string detect maybe. I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll, we can maybe try. Okay, so let me, yeah, and I guess if you had the exact name, then it would look mm -hmm. just like this. So it's equal to Georgia O'Keeffe. Mm -hmm. And string detect, I believe it is this way around. Mm -hmm, I think so. We'll try it and find out. We'll try it. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. So that's a good solution because string detect is a command from the stringer package, which matches partial strings. So there's 117 Georges, or well, rows that include a George. But that's a good question. That's a really helpful um, tip to using filter with partial names like this. And in general, the stringer package is pretty cool to check out if you're doing something that has a lot of text. Okay, so now for a very specific uh, type of filter, which is very useful, is the command called distinct. And distinct works like a filter, but it only returns like one row for each of the values that you look for. So we could have, for example, artist, distinct, artist gender. And this pulls out, okay, across the entire artist data frame, the different values of artist gender that I find are male and female. And so that before on the raw data, that was male, female, and NA, but here it's male and female. 
And you can also use it for combinations. So let's look at distinct artist name, artist gender, and artist nationality. And now assuming that in this data set, every artist has one name and the gender and the nationality don't change, which isn't necessarily the case. But if that is the case in this data set, then we'll get one row for each artist, including their gender and nationality. And if it did change, we'd get two rows, one for each of the combinations that it finds, or three. So here we get the artist name and their gender and nationality. So that's helpful for, especially if you're trying to get like a feel for your data or if it's new data, you can look at um, distinct to pull out what the different values are. Okay, and now the, the, the next two commands that I'm gonna show are the ones that are the next three. So separate pivot wider and pivot longer are a little bit more tricky in terms of wrangling, but they're the ones that I find are most likely to be needed to get data that's not tidy into tidy format. And one of them is separate. And this takes two columns and, or sorry, one column and makes it separates it into two columns based on a certain character. And this is useful if in a tidy data set, you have one column that has two observations in it. So here, what I could think of as an example was the artist name column. So as you um, may have noticed, the artist name always has the first name and the second name, the last name. Some of them might have three names, but I'm just going to separate into two columns by piping the data set into the separate command. The first argument is the column that you want to separate. So right now, the existing column that should be separated is artist name. The second is SEP, which stands for separator. So what, what symbol is between the two parts of this column that it should be separated on? And um, here I've selected the space. And you can notice that it's in quotes. So this could also be like a comma or dash, uh, depending what's in your data. And then into, and you give um, the options for what it should be split into in terms of like the column names. So here I've used this C and parentheses to give multiple arguments. And I wanna call the first column first and the next one the last. So if I run this, you'll see that it goes along the spaces and the first time it hits the space, it separates um, from first name to last name. So if there's multiple spaces, which I'm sure it comes up at some point, then it's gonna just take the first one so I guess as soon as it sees a, a space, it will split. OK, maybe there's no examples of that. Oh, yeah, for example, here, um, it's taken that. And then when it sees a space, it's it's split again. So that didn't work very well for this name. But basically, it looks for the separator, and then it splits it into two columns. But you should be aware if things like this are going to happen in your in your data. Okay, any questions on that one? Um, no, no questions so far. Okay. Uh, the opposite of separate, by the way, is unite. So for example, we could unite, if we had like first and last name, we could unite them into one column. It works pretty similarly. If you need to use that, I would suggest looking at the documentation and you get like an example um, for what you need to give us as arguments. So the name of the new column, the separator again, and the columns that you want to um, combine. That's useful. And then the last two, which are kind of notorious for being trickier wrangling commands, but also super helpful because if you have a situation, there's a few other things that will help you as much as a pivot command. So you have two commands, which are pivot wider and pivot longer. Wider will make your new data set wider than it was before, and longer will make it longer than it was before. Um, and we'll see some examples. So let's look at pivot wider first. And this will often be used for making summary tables. It often does not make data tidy. It actually often makes data untidy. But sometimes it's helpful to have like a summary table to look at. 
So here I'm taking um, the artist's summary. Um, I made this, I deleted some lines of code from this example, which are now important. So I'm going to have to write them again. And I, in this, previously I had made this artist summary data frame, which consisted of the artist data frame um, grouped by gender and summarized, or I think just counted. Oh, I think the wrong tree on that error there. So um, we're going to go over group by and count in the next workshop. Actually, we moved it. So that's why this wasn't there. But what I've done here is just created a very simple uh, table where I have how many rows in the entire data set are artists who are female and how many rows in the entire data set are artists that are male. Just because this is a really easy um, data set to look at in terms of pivoting wider. So if I take this data set and I feed it to pivot wider, then what it wants to know is where do I get the names from and where do I get the values from? And actually, I think what I did here was had the year so that you had like how many males and how many female artists were represented in each year of the textbook. So this is the data set that I believe I started this example with. And I wanted to pivot wider and I wanted to take the names of the columns. So there should be new columns added that have the labels that the artist gender column have. So I want one that says male and one that says female. And then I just wanna have those filled with the values from the end column. So I want to show you um, that artist's summary. So when I do this, what it will do is now it takes the year and we now have columns that say male and female and it has the count of how many male and female artists were included in that version of the textbook. So you can see that um, there are very few females represented in the textbooks until the 80s, then there's still a very disproportionate amount of male artists. And even still till today, it's nothing even close to um, parity here. But so to remember what we look like before, this is what the original data set looked like. Where it had the year, the gender, and then the count. And this is now the summary table where male and female have become the column names and the values have come from the end column. And this is kind of tricky conceptually because this is pretty easy to read this, this table, but it's actually not tidy because you have two observations in each row. So for each row, you have an observation of how many men there are and how many women there are. So it was originally tidy in this format where you had the gender and then the count separately. But as a summary table, it reads nicely like this. Now, what was bugging me is these NAs. And the NAs here, what's happening is actually when you look at the original data set, there is not a row for female in 1926 because the, the count command didn't find any to count. There were none to count, so it just didn't even make that row. And what you can do for that is use this values um, fill command. And so here I've taken it and I want to fill with zero anything that doesn't exist. So we can have um, zeros fill in for where there were no rows. So all I have here is the same pivot wider. Where do I want the names of the column to come from? Where do I want the values of the columns to come from? And then I filled it with zero. Any questions on this? 
Uh, no, no questions. We're just sharing uh, tips about fuzzy string matching in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's pivoting wider and you can see this got wider. In this example, it didn't really because we just took two columns and made them into two new columns, but um, it can make it wider. I guess it did make it wider because now there are 22 rows and three columns. And before there were 40 rows and three columns. So this has kind of got proportionally squished. Now pivot longer is the inverse, and this puts data into long form. And usually, if you don't take it too far, long form is tidy or tidier. And I always like to start this by just using the basic um, arguments, like the very necessary ones, and then adding the additional ones. So here we have artists wide, which is this one that I just made. And if I want to pivot it longer because I want to get it back in the format it was, then I just have to say which columns need to be pivoted longer. And I use female and male. So it's taking female and male, which are here are their columns, and it's putting them here into one column, which they've called name, and it's taking whatever was in that column and calling it value. That's a very basic thing you can do is you say which of the two columns now need to be like put into one column. But of course, name and value aren't very descriptive. So often you will use the names to and values to command. And the names to takes care of what the names of the columns should be called. So here the names of the columns become the gender, new gender column, and the values that were in the cells become the count column. And I always do this after because I feel like if you do this, you do this part of the command first, it tells you name and value in case it's like less clear. Sometimes to me, it's less clear which one is the name and which one is the value. So I like to do this and take a look at it and then add the names to and values to command to specify the column names. But you can see now we've squished the data set into like a um, a wide format, and now we've stretched it back out to long format, which is the format that it was already in. And there's a couple of examples that we can practice, especially these last three commands, with looking at which of the following data sets are tidy. So just to remind you how we started this whole meetup, tidy data, each column is one and only one variable. So if you read the column names from left to right, this should basically be all the variables that you might want to model, that you will or might want to model. Each row has to be a single observation, and each cell is a single measurement. So there shouldn't be two cells that contain, or sorry, one cell that contains two pieces of information. Now I'm going to show you a couple of examples, and maybe you can write in the chat if you can identify um, what is wrong with them or like what is untidy about them, or on the flip side, how you would make it tidy. So however you want to think about that. So I'll give you a hint that I don't think any of these are tidy. We'll see if, if, we'll see if I'm correct. But I think, if I remember correctly, I have three examples that are all not tidy. And these are all from the Tidy Tuesday um, repository. So if you're interested in like playing around with any of them, you can. I have made them all untidy myself, so it's a bit sneaky. But this one I called Bob Ross. And Bob Ross is this famous um, TV painting guy who had, I don't know when, had all these, these TV shows where he would like show you how to paint a beautiful mountain scene. And I took just part of this data set here and created this. So you can see that one column is the season. And then I've counted how many paintings were made in that season using each of the like basic painters colors. So like black gesso, bright red, umber, cadmium yellow, liquid black, Indian yellow, liquid clear. So it just goes through and says, okay, in season one, Bob Ross painted two paintings with black, 10 paintings with bright red, nothing with umber, 10 with cadmium yellow, and so on. So I'll give you a second, but see if you can put in the chat, what is not tidy about this data set? Or if you think it's tidy, you can say so, but it's not, so. <laughs> Oops. 
any thoughts on what um, is not tidy about this data or what we might have to do to this data? Yeah, good. So somebody wrote all the color, all the colors should go in one column. Exactly. So we should have a column which tells us what the colors are. And um, they also suggest this is going from wide to long format. And that's exactly right. So here we have multiple observ like the observation that is going on here is just um, what is the color and then the and then the, the value is how many paintings were there. So we could take this Bob Ross data frame and we could pivot it longer. And the columns that we want to use here are um, black gesso. I think you can also say minus season because you want everything except season. Is that right? Yeah, I think you can also use select syntax. Which you, I, like. I think so, yeah to try so we could use the yeah so we can do both i'll show you both okay. you can either use what's called select syntax which is the same syntax that works in the select um the select call here and the the, the problem here is of course that i don't want to have to write out all these names i could you know i could write black so comma bright red blah, blah blah that would take a little while but i could do it um but an easier way is to either use the select syntax and this takes whatever order they're in and if you use this colon, it goes from one to the other. So all columns from black gesso all the way to crimson would work. And another, which is also considered select syntax, the Julia just said, which is actually easier, is to say minus season. And what that will do is all the columns except for season, which in this case, the only columns we have is season and colors. So actually Julia's um, suggestion here is a little bit more beautiful. So we can use minus season to take all columns except season and pivot them longer. And again, this is my process of doing names and values. So then I can do names to, and maybe name that color and values to, um, maybe I'll just do N for number of episodes or something. And so now this is tied here. It still counts per season. But now, for example, you could plot this and you could use the color variable to make like different bars based on the color. Um, and that's that is now tidy format. Are there questions on that one? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so we're, we're kind of at time, but I think I'll go ahead and show you these other two just because it will only take um, a moment. And I think maybe maybe it's helpful, but if you have to go, you have to go and thanks for joining. But if not, um, this is a data set that's also Tidy Tuesday, which looks at cats. And the cats are given a name, um, their, their sex is recorded, as well as how many things they caught, like while hunting per month. And then we're also looking at how many hours they were indoors and how old they are. So maybe we want to like make a model later that predicts um, the prey per month based on like the hours indoor and the age. Does anybody see what is not tidy about this? Um, I'll go ahead and tell you. So what's weird about this is that the observed column here has actually like two different answers, like two observations, but they're both about the same cat. So we have like variable names that are actually here being used as values in a column. But because they are variable names or like categories, they should be column names. And so what's actually necessary here is to pivot it wider, I believe. So you wanna take the names of the column. So that, that would be located here in the observed. Oops. So that's where I wanna get the column names from. And the values that should 
go to that to come from observed number. I need another argument here. Okay, no, I don't. So if we do this, we've just taken this observed column and made them each their own column. So one of them is hours indoors and one of them is age years. And then the value from that comes with whatever like was next to that in the observed n column. And now this is tidy. And I see a question in the chat that says, if back to this um, example, if we regard season as an observation, isn't this already tidy? Um, but the problem is there that these are like the values of a uh, category, the category of color. So, yeah, each column should be a variable. And in this case, the variable is really color and not um, like the color black is not necessarily an you know, is not necessarily a variable. I, yeah, I'm not sure if that helps. Sometimes yeah. I find it useful to think about like, what if I wanted to make a graph from this data and what format would I need it to be in? And I think I would want to put the colors that were used on the X axis. So I need one column that is called color or that contains the colors. And then on the Y axis, I could put how often they are used, right? So that's why this format wouldn't wouldn't be ideal for making graphs, I think. So maybe that also helps. But graphs we'll, we'll talk about next time more as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and same if you wanted to model it. Like if you wanted to do a model, you might want to find out which color, but not, um, not necessarily bright red. But maybe it would depend. Yeah, I think the, the GDPod example is good. OK, and then finally, just to wrap up, this data set has different programming languages, their origins in terms of the year and who kind of founded them. And then they're just ranked based on like a survey. And the problem here in terms of tidy data is that this origin column has both the year and the founder in it. And we know that each column should only have one um, variable in it. So this is a common situation where you would use separate. And I always use this um, pop-up, by the way. That's what I'm looking at because it makes it a lot easier for me. So I know that there's the column argument that is origin. And there's the into argument, which is going to is where I should give like the new column names. So I want to separate into the column year and the column founder. And then the step um, argument. So here it's like space and then a dash and then a space. I'm, I'm going to include both those so we don't have like trailing or um, preceding white space. And if I run that, then we separate this into the founder and the year in separate um, columns. So no matter what's inside there, you can use like define it as a separator. Yeah, so that is um, all you need to know to get started with tidy data and data wrangling. And there are a lot more commands in dplyr. There's like, I think we hinted at a couple of these stringer commands. There's a lot more to explore in terms of data wrangling, but the primary purpose is to get your data in this tidy format. And next time we'll talk about exploratory data analysis, which uses some of the same um, some of the same tools to look at your data, like summary, summary values, and also some graphing, especially for exploring your data. So we hope you'll join us uh, for that. And thanks, thanks for being here.